Good morning. This is a History 1301 lecture regarding the post-revolutionary period in American history. Uh, this is uh, Nathan Giesenschlag. The revolution, the American Revolution, was a turning point, of course, in our history and was one of the major events in world history in at least the last 500 years. The American Revolution, unlike many other revolutions, uh, though uh, long in stature or long in length, uh, the actual fighting of the revolution lasts from 75 or 1775 until 1781 uh, with the uh, fighting at Yorktown, but the actual war does not end formally until you have the Treaty of Paris of uh, 1783. All that to say, though, is, is that when we talk about this uh, American Revolution and, and all the hardship that goes with it, and there was a great deal of it, a revolution and wars that are as consuming as it was are going to uh, cause a lot of problems for the nation where the war is predominantly fought. Uh, you see this in an American sense when you look at, say, uh, uh, the South after the Civil War. Uh, you look at France and uh, the uh, low countries uh, in the afterwash of the First World War, and on and on we can go. Revolutions also often consume themselves. Uh, the unifying theme of fighting against the king or the government or invading, uh, occupying power, whatever, uh, that causes the revolution, oftentimes once the revolution is over, and even sometimes before it is completely over, the factions that have been welded together or at least uh, fused together to fight the invader, fight the interloper, fight the king, uh, once that threat is gone, then the uh, factions start to fight amongst themselves. Uh, almost uniquely in the history of man, the, uni the uh, American Revolution did not have that problem. Frankly, most uh, Americans were able to uh, come together after the revolution, and they had uh, there was no one uh, one there were no several sets of factions. I say it like that. Uh, the fact was is that when you talk about the American Revolution, and I may have alluded to this before in a previous lecture, the fact was is that uh, when you say who won the American Revolution, you say George Washington. And that's not obviously ex completely true historically. In fact, that's arguably very not true uh, in a large sense. Yet Washington, rightly so, is considered the symbol of the nation. He is considered, considered the symbol of the government, or the symbol of the struggle. Uh, and it was always the case in the American Revolution, and I've, I know I've said this, is, is that when uh, if you captured Washington or killed him or destroyed his army, then the revolution was essentially over. You could capture parts of the federal, uh, the uh, continental government, uh, yet you could still fight the revolution. But Washington's army and Washington himself became the symbol of the revolution. So the thing is, is that unlike other revolutions that you see in France or elsewhere, you do not have the same, uh, uh, or even Mexico for that matter, you don't have the same singular unifying figure in Washington. Uh, he is beloved, uh, and uh, he is a great man in my opinion. I think that's generally a uh, is historically uh, supported uh, thing. He is a great man, and I think he's actually a good man too. Uh, but all that to say, that does not mean that uh, that the, there were no pitfalls. Uh, the United States uh, does not consume itself with a civil war. Uh, Washington, as I said in the previous lecture, has a large part to play because he does not assume for himself power as if he was an emperor or dictator or uh, some sort of military chieftain or a little alone king. The fact was, though, uh, but the revolution comes to an end. Peter's out. Washington submits his resignation uh, of his commission. <coughs> Excuse me, and then proceeds to go home back to Mount Vernon. Yet there were major problems to be had, uh, and they're all over the place. The revolution and any major conflict oftentimes will push off those uh, in those secondary issues. In the time of a revolution, uh, it would be considered a secondary issue, uh, such as say the debt or uh, some uh, minor factionalism disputes between states. The revolution had the ability, because it is the thing that is the most important event happening in the nation writ large, uh, it has the ability to push all those other considerations off uh, for decisions in the future. But once the revolution's over, those uh, secondary dis uh, issues now come to the forefront. And uh, one of the things we've got to deal with coming out of this revolution is the fact uh, that you are looking at a government or governments, plural, uh, a co continental government uh, based in Philadelphia and a few other cities. Uh, in addition to that, you also have the uh, state governments and the, obviously the various states, <coughs> who all of which had signed the Treaty of, uh, of Paris themselves and had their own individual copies. All of these states and all of these uh, 
uh, continental, uh, the, the continental government were drowning in a mountain of debt. Uh, it, it, for us, the numbers are going to be small because we're used to uh, a lot more debt. If you know the debt of the United States, it's somewhere around $25 trillion as we uh, record this lecture. Uh, and just a few days ago, the Congress passed a, a $2 trillion spending bill, a relief bill, whatever you want to call it, uh, and probably will have to raise taxes at some point, but that's down the road. We'll see. But anyways, all that to say is the United States has a lot of debt, but in the post-revolutionary period, you're looking at mountains of debt in the tune of $150 million, uh, most of which was borne by the Continental Congress and the Continental Government, but there was a lot of it uh, being handled by the states as well. And therein lies one of the problems. You have the debt, and that's bad enough, but then the question becomes, how do you pay for it? And you can basically pay for debt, uh, at least as a government can, in about two or three different ways. Number one, you can uh, issue a whole bunch of money and just print out uh, all the money you want, but that causes hyperinflation and devalues the currency, and there's a whole lot of issues <coughs> and historical problems with that, as you, many of you know a little history. I uh, think of Germany after the First World War with their uh, war debt and their war obligations. But the fact of the matter is not only does uh, we have you can print it, uh, but you can also pay it, uh, meaning straight up pay it with interest as you are supposed to, and that's good, and that's probably the best way to go about it. Or you can uh, issue uh, more debt, which is uh, practical if you take care on how you do it, or you can simply just repudiate it. And you'll see, uh, particularly in Latin American countries in the 1980s and 90s, will do some of that, which is repudiate their debt, which basically means we aren't going to honor our debt. You, you were the sucker for buying the bond, or you were the sucker for buying the stock or the note or whatever the, the stamp was. All that to say, though, is the U.S. Uh, government has some issues, and they they they're not they have a lot of debt, and they got to pay it. Well, some of the colonies are going to pay their debt straight up. They will pay it with interest. And how do you pay debt with interest? Uh, and you frankly going to do some taxes. One of the classic examples of the the the, the weaknesses of the continental system, the, con the confederation system after the American Revolution, is found in the Shays Rebellion. The Shays Rebellion is basically a debtor's rebellion in western Massachusetts, and uh, though it gets put down eventually by the Massachusetts government, it has the effect in the mid-1780s of scaring the very impo uh, the, the important leaders of the country, the Washingtons and the Franklins and the Jeffersons. Uh, he, Jefferson's actually overseas at this point, but the Madisons and the, the New York establishments and so on of what can we do. And uh, that was a problem there. And then you have some states who basically are going to uh, uh, print some money and are going to not pay their debt properly. And it, it, there's a, a whole patchwork of state uh, confusion, frankly, states handling the uh, debt issue. And then the Continental Congress is also part to blame, too. And it's really more than just the Congress's problem. And as, as I said to you before, <coughs> in the mid-1780s, the Congress is largely dominated by second-rate individuals, third-stringers, and uh, zeros and nobodies. You have some great men in there. Uh, James Madison was a member for a while. But for most part, you have uh, just the, the, the great men of the early days of the Revolution are long gone. Some have died. Most have moved on, uh, fought in the war. Others became diplomats, John Adams and Jefferson, for example, Franklin as well. Uh, others became governors, uh, uh, Sam Adams for a while, Jefferson again. All that to say, though, is the Congress uh, is saddled uh, by inferior talent. So sometimes, sometimes it matters who you have in a, a, a legislative body, in this case, a Continental Congress. But the second thing you have is, is that the Articles of Confederation are an inferior document. They're just not very good. It is a, uh, if you want to write it down like this, the Articles of Confederation is a document between the states and the Continental Congress. It, there's no we the people stuff. That's all Constitution. But the Articles of Confederation, adopted shortly after uh, the turning point in the American Revolution, which is Saratoga, uh, uh, dominate, excuse me, that document, which basically the French uh, foisted upon us, they didn't give us the document, we had to write it ourselves, but the French said, if you want our money for this revolution, you have to have some sort of governing document, you have to have some sort of uh, playbook by which you're going to operate as a government that we can recognize. 
So the Articles of Confederation are very weak and very tepid. They're poorly written. It's uh, unwieldy. Uh, the Continental Congress can only uh, badger and cajole. It is a single body. It's not a bicameral legislature. There is no president. Uh, and so you run by committees. On and on I can go is to say is, is that the Continental Congress is, uh, is a, ba a weak institution structurally and by makeup with the people who are in it. Secondly, the states cannot be compelled, and that's one of the issues, too. You always have to keep that in the back of your mind when you talk about dealing with people uh, and dealing with other uh, political entities in a federal system, like we're going to talk about with the Constitution. You have to have the ability to not just ask, but compel people to do something. And that's where the state power, the police power of the state comes in, in the form of the state of Texas compelling you to, uh, to obey the speed limit through fines and other negative reinforcements. <coughs> they can have all the PSAs they want, but ultimately, for a lot of folks, if you, uh, if, if you didn't have the threat of a DPS trooper or a local uh, county mounty pulling you over, that, that wouldn't do it. On a more federal level, much more national level, how do you compel people to pay their taxes? Well, the threat of an IRS audit is an example, and a very vivid one maybe for a few of you. Like, yeah, I remember that. It was an unpleasant experience. No one enjoys an IRS audit. But that's the threat. For some, you go through it. Uh, others, they're going to end up having to deal with it, or rather they, to avoid the audit, they go ahead and basically pay the taxes. There has to be a compelling aspect. There has to be the force aspect of government, not just the carrot aspect as well, but the, the carrot and the stick. And the problem with the Continental Congress is it never had the, the stick to be able to compel the states to, uh, to do what they needed to do. So the Continental Congress was often short of money, short of talent, short of structural stability. The states are bickering amongst themselves. There's issues in the, in the currency, and there's issues in commerce. There's jealousies and rivalries between the states. Small states distrust large states, and on we can go. It is a very, very uh, problematic system. <coughs> Compounding it all was the fact that the U.S., uh, when the United States pulled out and broke away from England and Great Britain, well, that took us out of the favored nation or favored uh, position in the, the British Empire. While we were in the empire, and arguably had we stayed in through the form of a commonwealth, uh, we would have had a favored position to trade with the mother country. And, and our, for a time, and I'm not arguing we should have done this, mind you, but uh, during the war, the British uh, sent up peace uh, signals to us, basically saying, we'll give you everything you want but independence. We'll even give you essentially a commonwealth status where you're quasi-independent, but you're still under the headship of the parliament and the headship of the king. But we'll give you everything you want, including economic uh, advantages and, and favorites, favor, uh, favoritism. We rejected that. And so when we won the war, uh, one of the things we were supposed to get was uh, <coughs> complete control of our borders, but we didn't get that. The British didn't completely uh, abandon some of those western um, uh, forts for the, some time. Secondly, uh, there's going to be, once we go out of the British system, we are just like one face in the crowd, and frankly, uh, we don't have any special leverage uh, over the British at this point in time. Always important to remember that the United States in 1770, excuse me, 1783 or 1786 or 7 is a weakling nation. We are not strong. We are not powerful. We don't have a strong central bank. Uh, it is a weakling nation, and uh, it's going to hurt our economy. The war uh, hurt uh, the economy, and the peace will actually hurt the economy as well, because a lot of trading that might have been done, especially prior to the war, can no longer be done. So you have economic uh, instability, economic problems all throughout the United States in various forms, but the economy of the United States is uh, wobbly to go along with the governmental problems that I've already uh, gone with as well. Here's another issue that sometimes works in the background, but for their time period, it would have been a big issue. What do you do with the, with the, gov with the religion? What do you do with religion? Obviously, during the, uh, our time with the British, uh, in some ways, in some facets more so than others, and in some areas more than others, uh, you had the Anglican Church, the Church of England, uh, become the formal, uh, the formal church of a colony.
Like I said, though, that we know that Massachusetts was a dissenter's colony in the sense that it was a dissenter full, filled with uh, uh, descended Puritans. And you'll have other parts that are filled with old Presbyterians who could not stand uh, the idea of being under the headship of a bishop from uh, London or anything like that. <coughs> Places like uh, South Carolina or, or uh, the Virginia Tidewater, more amenable to uh, a London bishop, still uh, quaffed at the idea of having an established church. So, do you start to disestablish religion? And that's going to take time. Some colonies do it faster than others. Some uh, wait until almost 1820 or so. But the long and the short of it is, what do you do with religion? Remember, a Baptist is not going to want to pay taxes to uh, an Episcopalian. That's another way of saying Anglican or Church of England. The, a Baptist is not going to want to pay taxes to, a, uh, to an Anglican bishop or an Anglican church. That was an anathema to him. And it's, uh, that's uh, one of the DNAs of the Baptist movement. Even to this day, is there's a certain plucky, sometimes uh, uh, deleterious to your, uh, to, to your movement, but uh, there's a plucky uh, independency idea. You see it in the organization of Baptist churches, for example. Uh, yes, you may have a convention, you may have an association, but ultimately Baptists have from the beginning in American history said that Baptist churches are autonomous unto themselves. We are free and independent. And so we don't want to pay taxes to somebody we don't support and we don't believe in. We don't believe in the structures of the Episcopalian Church and or the Anglican Church. Same difference. Presbyterians would say it differently, but the idea is the same. We don't believe that there should be an established church. And so you're going to start to see slowly but surely the disestablishment of religion in the United States, especially on the federal level when you get the Constitution and so on. But even that, though, though many would agree with it, it was still a rather <coughs> radical notion because the idea of disestablishing religion and saying nothing about uh, saying who you should believe or what we are or who is our God, that's a, a radical idea. And, uh, you know, it, it's a pit and parcel of the Enlightenment uh, that religion should be rele uh, kept to the, to the individual's choice. And that's essentially what you get with the new Constitution when it comes, with the Bill of Rights, especially the First Amendment. But this idea of uh, freedom of conscience, individual conscience, that's is an Enlightenment idea. Uh, and it's also a, uh, a Reformation idea in the sense that uh, you have a lot of outgroups, the Baptists to a certain degree, the Methodists, certainly Presbyterians, and certainly other groups that are more splinterish uh, than I've already mentioned. They would support that. They would be say, let leave us alone. But if you were an Anglican or you were a Methodist, especially the uh, Wesleyan Methodist, or you were a Congregationalist, you may not be so excited about giving the Baptists free run and having them set on an equal level when you over the years have been supported by perhaps taxes uh, and official sanction, uh, meaning good, th uh, good sanction by the state. So that is an upheaval sort of moment. These are, these are upheaval, upheaval things, whether it's uh, economics, politics, religion. These are big issues. These are mighty big issues uh, that is out there. And so that brings us to 1784-85 uh, territory. Uh, the war is over. The war is over by a few years, but you're already seeing those, those issues and those problems that were masked by the war and were shoved to the side by the war are now being brought to the forefront, and here we go, something has to be done. Enter in your notes a new man and a new name, and that man's name is James Madison. James Madison in the 1780s is all is in his early 30s. Madison is a small, short man. <coughs> Excuse me. Allergies are pretty bad right now. Uh, but anyways, uh, Madison was nobody's example of a physical specimen. Washington was a physical specimen. I think I've said that emphatically to you. Washington stood 6'1", 6'2", on a good day. He was a strong, strapping man. Washington was never accused of being the greatest thinker in the world, but at the same time, he had a good man mind about him, and he knew how to use others in, in a good way, in a benign way. But when we talk about Madison, Madison was uh, on a good day five foot two. And he was soaking wet 110 pounds, short, retiring, 
regularly wore black or some sort of black ensemble outfit. Uh, the fact of the matter was is that he was sickly as a child. He was physically infirm to the point where he could not fight. It would have been bad for his health, and he did not fight in the American Civil American Revolution. Uh, it was not held against him by the major players at the time period that he did not fight, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, but at the same time, physically, he would it would probably killed him because so many people did get sick and die in those armies in that era. So when it comes to Madison, and he. Uh, uh, for what he lacks in the physical uh, uh, ability, by the way, uh, just kind of a high-pitched voice. Can you imagine James Madison trying to lead an army through the through a war? Anyways, uh, you see that War of 1812, there were some issues there. But with uh, Madison's uh, shortcomings on the physical side, by the way, he was, he was not a great public speaker most of the time. Uh, a set piece of which he had to read didn't do well with that. Pretty good arguer and debater. Uh, you'll see that in the convention and particularly in the, the debates in Virginia over the Constitution. The fact of the matter is when it comes to Madison, he was a first-rate brain. Uh, I think it was Washington who said, maybe apocryphally, but he probably would have said something like this, maybe he did say this, and they were friends when I, the quote I'm about to give, Washington and Madison were friends for the most, for most of their lives. Maybe the end might have changed a little bit. But in the 1780s, they were friends. And, uh, Washington said about Madison, so great a brain on so little a body. Others referred to him, uh, uh what was his name, uh, not Washington Roebling, uh, uh, Washington Irving. Anyways, the, uh, the uh, legend of Sleepy Hollow guy, uh, he said, uh, so, uh, a, call, he, Irving, called uh, Madison a withered little Apple John. Anyways, not a compliment there. But Madison, all the same, though, uh, Madison was a brilliant man. He read everything in sight. Uh, started out as a Christian, becomes a deist on the religion side, but he was a very stressed out defender of conscience rights, uh, religious conscience particularly. And he actually had a lot of friends in the Baptist movement who would have never have agreed with him on religion, but because Baptists often were persecuted and he said, leave these people alone, uh, that was uh, a pretty good thing, and which, by the way, is true actually of Jefferson and the Baptists as well. Le this idea of conscience freedom and their freedom of religion, the freedom of the right to practice as you see fit with uh, some very uh, minor uh, restrictions, uh, that was uh, uh, Madison's thinking. Madison wasn't just a thinker on conscience issues. He's also a prolific reader about uh, government and how government should run. And in fact, in a sense, while the war was going on, Madison, looking to the longer term, is thinking about how can we reorganize the U.S. government into such a way that the U.S. government uh, is actually functional. And so what you see with the Constitution is often much the handiwork of James Madison. So when we talk about who is called the father of the U.S. Constitution, it is James Madison because you see his, see his fingerprints all over the Constitution. Do they adopt, does the Constitutional Convention adopt everything lock, stock, and barrel? No, they don't. But at the same time, it is Madison first and foremost in the Constitution and in the Convention pushing his ideas. Madison's married to uh, Dolly uh, Madison. Uh, that's his uh, wife. She is vivacious. She's the she's literally the type of woman who walks into the room and everybody's head turns because yes, she is an attractive woman, but more especially because she is a charismatic woman. She is a vibrant woman. She is the proverbial flower, and the dour James Madison, who actually could tell pretty good jokes in private. Uh, was uh, always seemingly the proverbial pot around the flower. So everybody said hello to Dolly, and James Madison sometimes seemed like he was just <coughs> there as uh, window dressing. Anyways, but Madison in the mid-1780s is going to start to, like anybody who with eyes could see, uh, could see that the U.S. government and the U.S. Uh, uh, situation was in bad shape and it needed a reboot, it needed a reform. Uh, they're going to try to have what's called the Annapolis Convention in about 1786. Uh, it doesn't get anywhere, but Madison is laying his groundwork. The fact is, is that he's doing his legwork. He fails to get uh, a lot of traction at first, but you start to see other states, uh, whether it was New York or Delaware or Georgia or whatever, they're starting to see that, yes, there's some real major problems with this Confederation uh, setup. Shays Rebellion is a, as I said a few minutes ago, is a crystallizing moment for many. It was the symbol of what, uh, of mob rule that many American leaders feared. You don't want the mob to turn loose and become sort of a degenerate state. All that to say is, is that by the time he gets to 1786 and now 1787, he, Madison, was ready to go. 
and he had done his legwork. He had communicated with multiple men, important individuals in the uh, U.S. who were on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, and he was a friend, uh, Madison was, with Jefferson, and those two talked a lot. And the idea basically is, is that Madison has uh, recruited well. He recruited prominent individuals such as George Washington to support a new government. Uh, Washington did not throw away his retirement easily. He did not really want to get involved in politics. But Washington, besides the uh, um, pleadings of Madison, Washington could see that something had to be done for the government. Something had to be done for the United States. Otherwise, we would have thrown all those lives away for nothing, and we could have been picked apart by Spain or France or maybe Great Britain again. So this idea of a new government, this idea of a convention is going to meet. Uh, it is called in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. And the Constitutional Convention of 1787 uh, is, uh, in its own right, kind of a who's who of American history. Some of the prominent names in American history at the time period are not present. Uh, names such as John Adams, he is not at the convention. He is uh, in Europe as a diplomat. Thomas Jefferson, he is in France as a diplomat. Uh, they're out of the out of the picture, <coughs> but a constitutional convention will have George Washington presiding, and he is uh, kind of a uh, he he does not participate. Washington does not participate in the debates, and there's some big debates in that convention, and uh, he doesn't participate for the most part. He only speaks uh, in a formal sense as far as uh, motions and handling uh, business, and because he, he's presiding as president of the convention. Uh, he's only in a, an official capacity. He only offers his opinion late in the convention on one minor issue. Uh, and it was not determined. But Washington's name is credence. Washington lending his name to it gives it authority. And Washington being there, because unless you were really a conspiratorial sort of guy, uh, and some people like, say, a Tom Paine would have been that. Uh, but Payne's not there. He's out. Uh, he's uh, he's the type of guy who eats the uh, who, who bites the hand of those who feed him. But Washington was never accused seriously, anyways, of trying to set himself up as a dictator. Had he wanted to do that, the reasoning went, went he would not have resigned that commission that I talked about in a previous lecture. Well, anyways, Washington uh, being there is a big deal. Franklin, who is late in life, he's going to die in a few years, anyways. Uh, Franklin, who's an old man beset by gout and other uh, ailments and infirmities uh, attendant with age and overweight and all that sort of thing, uh, he's not much of a participant, especially compared to the 75 uh, and 76 Continental Congress, but he's there and he lends his name. And that's, uh, uh, that's something else. So those are some heavy names. But the real, in a sense, the real, the real debates are going to be handled by the younger men in the room, the, the less well-known at that time. Uh, not just Madison, to be sure, but another name worth noting is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, who I'll give a fuller account of in another lecture. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, he of the, the play that's very popular, in this, uh, at this, generally speaking, at the time of this recording. Hamilton was a, a charismatic figure in his own right, and he's there representing the state of New York. He is uh, closely associated with Washington. But Alexander Hamilton and in, in the convention are going to have to grapple with some major issues. And by the way, being in that hall in 1787, uh, that convention was a hot affair. They closed the windows, they closed the shutters, basically, and so people would not hear in. They wanted some secrecy, and not completely uh, sealed up secrecy, but uh, fairly close. And uh, they wanted to be able to, for the convention to debate in private what needed to be debated, and, and so that there wouldn't be hangers-on and listeners in the window, because there are devious and small men who might try to make exploits of it. Well, anyways, when it comes to uh, the convention itself, there's going to be about three major issues, maybe four, that we need to spend our time on. The first one is, in the convention, the first uh, issue, major issue is, how does the Congress look? What is, how are we going to deal with the representation of the states versus uh, the big states versus the small states? That's a big one. Number two, how do we handle the issue of interstate commerce? How do you handle the inter issue of interstate commerce? Who, in an essence, who regulates interstate commerce? You may ask yourself the question, what is interstate commerce? Well, that's kind of in the eye of the beholder sort of question. Some would say it's only this. 
over time, the U.S. has read uh, the, the, the terminology, what is interstate commerce, the, the, the right to regulate it as a widening and a seemingly ever-widening idea. But who regulates interstate commerce? Uh, to a lesser degree, uh, the issue of slavery is there, but it's understood, frankly, that slavery was going to be untouched. Uh, some have said it was the coiled snake under the table. I think that's overly dramatic. But everybody understood that slavery was a fact, and it was not going to be undone. In you know, hindsight, it would have been great had they been able to settle the issue of slavery once and for all right there and save the country of the, uh, the Civil War. It just wasn't going to happen, though. That just was not in the cards. And then you've got other issues about uh, how do you amend the Constitution, how do you uh, separate the power, separation of powers. That's a really, of course, a very big one uh, between the, federal, the, the presidency and the Congress and the Supreme Court and so forth. That's a Madisonian practice. And what's the relationship of the states to the, uh, to the new federal government that's going to come out of this? Uh, so you have all these issues that are out there. Uh, but anyways, long story short is, is that uh, there's some big ones and they're secondary. But uh, the biggest one probably has to do with what does the Congress look like. As the summer of 1787 uh, gets going and starts to uh, unwind and this convention is now in session with representatives from pretty much every state, uh, the obvious fault lines right away is this. Uh, we, small states like a Delaware or Georgia, Georgia was tiny, it may have been big in, in land, but tiny in numbers. <coughs> we, uh, we Del folks from Delaware, we Georgians, we, uh, we do not want to be dominated by Virginia and New York. New York, Virginia, and Pennsylvania are the three big states. Massachusetts kind of falling in between, or kind of after that. But uh, in fact, uh, I don't remember the man of the, the man's name. But one uh, delegate there, as the the debate got heated at times, basically said, "We would rather go back to England. We would be rather drug back into England in chains than be uh, lashed to and be uh, subservient to Virginia." So there was some real animus about and some real angst by the small states about how do we relate to uh, Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania. Now, as you might expect, a big state and population like Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania would want to be the dominant dogs, the lead dogs, and the most important uh, dogs. Uh, I say that dogs, I mean states, but the most important states in a new union. And so there's that. It's just these, this natural uh, self-interest idea. Big states want to uh, support themselves. Small states want to protect themselves. And how do we get across it? During some of the heated debates, uh, Alexander Hamilton stands up one day and gives about a six-hour harangue, uh, a polemical speech. It may have been serious. It may have been uh, designed to try to knock the convention off center, off the off the high ground, and meaning off a high center. If you ever seen a truck bent over and stuck on a high center, <coughs> that would be the idea is to get it off of that. And Hamilton gives about a six-hour speech where he had. Uh, he pushes for and advocates for the abolition of the states and basically creating a union that where the central government, wherever it was located, the central government would be uh, supreme. And there would be only administrative districts, kind of like what they got in France and other nations. Well, anyways, that went nowhere, but at the same time, it scared uh, people into thinking that, oh, my, scared folks at the convention into thinking is that, oh, my, could there be an issue here? Ultimately, what we get out of this is the issue of, or rather, the U.S. Congress as we know it. And you have what was called the New Jersey Plan, which was, of course, a, a small state plan. And you had the Virginia Plan, which was a big plan. Eventually, what the, is brought out of those two plans, plus all the arguments and the back, uh, back alley deal, dealings. And, oh, by the way, we know a lot about this because uh, James Madison was an excellent gossip. Gossiping in the Bible is not is not especially the New Testament is not uh, looked upon favorably, but he Madison liked to talk. He liked to do his uh, gossiping in the evening, and a lot of those delegates after their formal uh, discussions in the daytime would retire to their hotels or their taverns or their inns and so forth that had taverns in it. And so there was a lot of food eaten and a lot of discussions given and, and had off the off hours off the books. And Madison wrote it all down in a diary each night. And so with what we know about the convention, uh, which was the diary, by the way, was not released until I think the last man had died. And, and uh, Madison was one of the last of the convention to, uh, to die. Anyways, the point is this, is that uh, we know as much as we do historically because of Madison's uh, talking and his writing and his keeping of those secret notes. 
Well, anyways, uh, what comes out of this all this debate and this acrimony is the issue and the, the resolution of this is called the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise is essentially the U.S. Congress as we know it today. Uh, I won't go through every nook and cranny of it, but I will say this is that you should know uh, and be prepared. Just I always say this for a class. I'll probably never change this as long as I teach. Uh, but you should be prepared to give a basic accounting of how the U.S. Congress is organized. Uh, what is the House of Representatives? Who leads the House of Representatives? What's the term of office of the House of Representatives? And those sorts of things there. <coughs> what, how is the House of Representatives organized? And, and the answer is, of course, on, uh, on uh, population. Today, there's 435 members, a population-based uh, organization. Big states have more, small states' population would have less. You need a census, of course. We're taking that right now in 2020. Uh, the fact of the matter is the U.S. House of Representatives, led by a speaker who is oftentimes, especially uh, as uh, the, the years unfolded, a speaker can become a very dominant figure. And I think worth noting, the Speaker of the House of, the, uh, the House of Representatives, uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, worth noting, is, uh, can be is so dominant, they're like uh, the Almighty uh, in power. And they can be also very uh, uh, punishing and, and, and harsh. Uh, one of the strongest speakers in the history of the United States is, uh, actually is Nancy Pelosi in her first term as, first turn as speaker. We'll see what this turns out like now. But her, uh, her first turn, she was one of the most powerful speakers ever. Uh, secondly, a person who was really one of the great speakers, longest serving speaker in the House, uh, uh, in the history of the United States is Sam Rayburn. Sam Rayburn of Texas up on the Red River in Fannin County, a town called Bonham. Uh, Rayburn was a prominent, prominent man and a uh, prominent speaker. He might have been president had he not been born in the South, meaning Texas, uh, but he served as speaker for about 20 years, and uh, Sam Rayburn uh, is worth remembering, a uh, very prominent man. And, and to say this fair, uh, to give you the idea how powerful a speaker can be, uh, in 1940, in, in 1941 particularly, uh, you had uh, it, was, it was becoming obvious that the U.S. was probably going to get sucked into the Second World War. There were a lot of folks who were hoping and praying against it, and there were a lot of folks who were in denial that it would happen, and others just simply said, we got sucked into a world war before. All it did was get our boys killed. Let us stay out of this war. So all that to say, though, is, is that uh, despite, and there were a lot of people in America in 1940 and 41 especially who said, keep us out of war. There was a very big uh, peace movement in the United States, or at least uh, an isolationist movement in the United States in 40 and 41. Um, Rayburn wasn't one of those individuals. And Rayburn basically, to give you an idea how powerful a speaker can be, Rayburn is going to help push through a uh, piece of legislation, and then more especially the bigger issue was reauthorizing it uh, in the Congress that was uh, going to create, for the first time in the history of the United States, in 1940 then, and re reauthorized in 41, a peacetime draft. Uh, as growing up kid, as I always thought, was, oh, you can only have a draft when there's a war on. That's not true at all. You can have a draft all the time if you want to. But uh, it really, it's really goes against the American grain and fiber to have a draft, at least uh, in peacetime. But the clouds of war were already gathered in Europe uh, in 1940 and 41. Hitlerism was on the march. Britain was alone. Uh, Soviet Union was tottering at that point in time. Uh, Barbarossa was about to uh, get going. And we had established a peacetime draft. Uh, it did not make the U.S. government, or rather the U.S. Army, completely ready by anybody's imagination, but it was better than it had been. But in 1941, there was a move uh, because to get it through the first time, there had to be a sunset provision. That, that was what people would agree to. In 1941, in 1941, that piece of legislation, that peacetime draft, was going to be brought back, uh, it brought back up again and reauthorized, and a continuation of the draft for another year or more. And it passed the House of Representatives by that much, by literally about one vote. And through the maneuverings and the actions and the machinations and the strength and the, all the, the, the full uh, force of a man in a powerful office knowing how to use those powers, Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House of Representatives, was able to ram through the House of Representatives a, a reauthorization of that, that peacetime draft in 1941. 
So, in a sense, you could say this about the House of Representatives, very combative. The, the rules are written in such a way uh, that is not designed for great debates and arguments and so forth. In essence, I've said it like this way before in class. I'm a Republican. You're a Democrat. Let's fight. Very pugilistic, very dominant. And one other thing about the House of Representatives worth remembering is the House of Representatives' most important power in its own right is, is that all bills of revenue must originate there. All bills of revenue must originate in the House of Representatives. And, le and over the years, they, the House has ceded that authority to the Senate somewhat, but that was really its greatest power, and they've given it away. Uh, I don't really care about impeachment because there's never been a president who has been removed from office after being impeached. Uh, that's uh, probably the next president will be impeached for something or another, uh, and maybe we'll see. But uh, it's, it's become more of a, a political theater than it has anything else over the years. Uh, Nixon would have been impeached, uh, meaning he would have been removed for office. He wasn't actually formally impeached by the House anyways <coughs> before he resigned in 74. But all that to say, though, is, is that the House of Representatives does things their own way. Uh, it's, it's really a reflection of uh, population and so forth. Uh, and one last thing to say about it, the House of Representatives in the mind of Madison and others like him was supposed to des uh, swing back and forth like a pendulum. So if the country was red hot on a certain issue, then they can elect a whole bunch of representatives in a, in a cycle, and they're going to support whatever those issue or issues are. If they are, they move away from it, the country changes its mind, it can back away like a pendulum swing in the other direction. It is supposed to be hot, maybe like a hot cup of coffee or a hot tea. The United States Senate, the other half of the U.S. Congress, is going to be more deliberate. It's, uh, in, in times gone by, it was called the greatest deliberative body in the world. I, I thought that was a little bit uh, cheeky on our side, but it was. It's, it's been known to have great debates. Uh, the... Uh, the Robert Hayne, uh, Daniel Webster debate, uh, the great debates of the 19th century. And in fact, actually, uh, when we talk about the U.S. Senate, this is a reflection of the small states. Uh, somewhat controversial today, actually, as I record this, uh, the U.S. Senate in the 19th, excuse me, in, is uh, set up by, as you well know, senators uh, that are, had what, uh, thir have to be 30 years old, 60-year terms, they're not all up at the same time, Every th a third of the, uh, of the Senate is uh, is up for election each time. And on top of that, in the early days of the Republic, worth noting too, especially for an exam sort of deal, is, is that the, uh, the Senate was not elected by the people. It's not direct election like the House is. In the, in the 19th century and in the very early days of the 20th century, at the, going from basically the writing of the Constitution, the U.S.A. state elected its own senator. So the state of Texas, its legislature, elected the U.S. senator from Texas. So that's how we did it. And so... Uh, the, the Senate was deliberate, uh, was supposed to be deliberative, uh, slow, uh, like a saucer catching the overspill of the House, uh, basically designed to slow down and make, uh, make thought out of the hasty actions of the, of the House representatives. Uh, you'll see this also, senators, uh, two per state, of course, and that's a sop to the uh, small states. Uh, so Delaware has the same representation as Virginia in a modern sense. Uh, Wyoming has the same representation as California. And some today say that's not fair. It, it is what it is. All that to say, though, is, is that the House, the U.S. Senate's greatest power, and I would write this in my notes, is, is that it is, has uh, advice and consent powers. It gives advice and consent to uh, the president on his appointments. Uh, obviously, senators, because they're fewer in numbers, are able to uh, um, have a lot of influence over, say, foreign policy, or at least have a lot of say in foreign policy, whether they have influence is another story. Uh, but all that to say, though, is that senators are, uh, are a special breed of individuals, and frankly, most senators think they can become president uh, or ought to be president. And so as we talk about this, uh, the, the, when we talk about the Congress uh, in the 19th century, and I, I think this is worth remembering and recording in your notes, in the 19th century and certainly the early days, uh, but uh, until the 20th century, Congress, with a couple of obvious exceptions, like a Jackson presidency or a Lincoln presidency because of the Civil War, but for the most part of the 20, 19th century, the Congress was the dominant branch of the federal government. The Congress was the biggest and most powerful branch of the federal government, with a couple of obvious exceptions, as I said, the Jackson presidency uh, and the Lincoln presidency are the, probably the two best and maybe the only ones. <coughs> and that was because of Jackson's personality and the way he was and the crisis of the Civil War under Lincoln. 
But anyways, uh, the Congress has special powers uh, delegated to it by the co Constitution. Number one, it's the biggest one they've got, and it's uh, it's run through uh, the committees. Uh, these two, these there are two basic committees uh, in the House, and two basic uh, there there are two important committees in the House and two important committees in the Senate that pl uh, apply to the Congress's most important power, which is the power of the purse, the power to tax, the power to spend. That is the most important power that the Congress has, the power to tax and the power to spend. So if you want to tax and you want to spend in the House of Representatives, the committee that writes tax laws is called Ways and Means. If you want to spend the money, the committee is called the Appropriations Committee. In the Senate, it is uh, the tax writing is called Finance, and Appropriations in the Senate is the Spending Committee. But the ability to tax and spend is one of the the power of the purse said differently is one of the most important powers maybe the most important power that deals Congress in and allows them to be able to control at least uh, perhaps manage uh, the actions of the government since the 20th century occurred uh, now in the 21st century Congress has reduced its power but that's another discussion for another time and I don't want to get into it here. A second major power of the Congress is, uh, as far as practical politics and practical governance is, con is concerned, uh, is the issue of the regulation of interstate commerce. Maybe in some respects, arguably in the 20th century, the biggest hook that the Congress hung a lot of its legislation off of was its ability to regulate commerce. And uh, the, the Constitution in its First Amendment says, or First Amendment, First, uh, um, first Article says, the Congress uh, shall have the ability, essentially, to make law uh, respecting the regulation of interstate commerce between the several states and the Indian tribes. Well, again, back to a question I posed a few minutes ago, what is interstate commerce? And if you read that word, interstate commerce, very widely, that gives Congress a lot, and the federal government by extension, a lot of leeway to write laws and to do things that you might not have thought was part of, of commerce, such as, say, uh, regulation of universities. That's an extreme example. But anyways, that uh, regulation of interstate commerce and, of course, the ability to enforce those regulations, those are major tools in the toolbox of the Congress. Can it declare a war? Yes. Can it impeach the president? Yes. But those are dramatic but rarely used things. For me as a professor, I'm far more interested in what can the Congress do uh, every day. What can the Congress do in a political sense? And so the Congress, uh, the first article of the, of the Constitution uh, deals with the Congress and deals with it quite uh, in great detail. Now, the second article of the Constitution deals with the presidency. As we know or should know, the president is appointed, or rather is elected not by the people, but by the Electoral College. Over the years in the history of the United States, the way the Electoral College was, or the electoral votes were assembled and counted and put together, uh, was uh, developed, in a sense, by uh, the states. The legislatures can say, okay, we will have voting. And if we're going to vote, we're going to have winner take all for the electoral votes, or we're going to have apportionment amongst the uh, how it, this, or we'll say, or the legislature literally can say, we, as the state of Texas, we are going to award our electoral votes to John Smith. You can do it that way if you want to. Now, obviously, to become president, you have to have some basic qualifications: 35, natural born citizen, uh, and so forth. The fact of the matter is, though, is, is that as far as, uh, as far as qualifications for the presidency are concerned, here's uh, a few more that you might, uh, they're unofficial, but you might put in. What makes a good president? Uh, oftentimes what qualifies you to be president, uh, here's the stepping stones to the presidency is another way to say it, uh, a general. If you look at the 19th century, especially after the Civil War, but even before the Civil War, there were many men who became president after having uh, achieved uh, glory as a general. Jackson and Zachary Taylor and William Henry Harrison, after the Civil War, Ulysses S. Grant and James Garfield and on and on. 20th century, most famously and really almost singularly, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. So being a general would be a good stepping stone to the presidency. What's another good stepping stone to the presidency? In the uh, 19th century, and I would write this one down because it pertains to us directly uh, in this class, uh, the most important stepping stone to the presidency is that of the Secretary of State slot. In the first 25 years or so of the, of the United States under the Constitution of 1787, 
the uh, Secretary of State oftentimes uh, eventually may be directly elevated to the presidency after being elected. You saw that with uh, Jefferson to a degree. You certainly saw that with Madison and Monroe and John Quincy Adams. And so it's, it's, it's a, a long history of the Secretary of State slot. In fact, actually, what qualified Hillary Clinton in 2016 to be president was her service, uh, not as so much as a senator, that was very short term, but her service as a Secretary of State, that she had been there and she knew the people. should also give you an idea in the early days of the Republic uh, how – a uh, big foreign policy was to the United States, if you believe that the Secretary of State is best equipped to lead the nation as a future president. So you'll also have, as I've alluded to already, a lot of senators who will try to run for president. Many don't get anywhere close to it. Uh, right now there seems to be a change in that. That seems to be that uh, being a senator or a former senator is a good stepping stone to the presidency. It was certainly true for Obama. Um, perhaps you could say that about Biden, but Biden was a former vice president. Uh, he's running in, in, at, at this recording. He's likely to be the Democratic nominee. Uh, but uh, in the 20th century, only two men made it that way, Warren Harding and John F. Kennedy. Uh, those are the only two. And then on top of that, another stepping stone to the presidency uh, is uh, that of governor. Lots of governors have gone from the governorship in New York, famously and most prominently, but also Ohio, a lot of Ohioans, a few Californians, uh, a Texan here or there. Uh, but lots of governors have become president of the United States. I mean, it's just kind of a training ground, naturally speaking, especially a big state like a California, Texas, New York, Florida, whatever, would be a natural training get ground for the next step of the presidency and executive action. Become prominent, say, in a hurricane breaks through Florida and smashes Florida, the governor of Florida is there on the spot, people notice him, uh, and so on. Andrew Cuomo, at the time of this uh, recording, is uh, being talked about perhaps in, uh, the, in case something big happens uh, with this virus outbreak and they, that uh, Biden can't do it, that there was some talk that Cuomo, because of him being governor of New York in the, in the epicenter of this, as, as I'm recording this, the epicenter of this virus outbreak, Cuomo would be a, a candidate uh, likely to be because he's governor and he's on the spot and he's, he's doing what he has to do. And last but not least, the uh, most uh, likely other stepping stone to the presidency uh, is going to be that is, uh, or possible would be that of vice president. Whether you run and get reelected or elected in your own right, right after you've been vice president, George Bush, Martin Van Buren, uh, Biden perhaps, uh, or you, because the president dies, then you elevate to the, to the slot. And so that's... Uh, that's obvious. So those are some stepping stones. Uh, until it changes, uh, you have to be a man. Uh, there, that's uh, You may say that's not right and whatever, and that's fine. Uh, but until a, a woman is elected president, uh, the, the unofficial qualification is it's prohibitively good for you to be a man and run for the presidency. That will probably change in my lifetime. I assume it will. Uh, I, I thought it would have changed actually in 2016. I thought Hillary was going to win that thing. But anyways, all that to say is at some point, and I imagine here in the near future, a, a woman will become, uh, will be the first elected president just a matter of time. All that to say, though, is, is that the presidency uh, is the most powerful in the modern sense, uh, the most powerful of the three branches of government. And I say he's the president. The president is the head of the executive. And the president's powers are really basically boiled out to several ways. Uh, one is commander-in-chief foreign policy. The fact that the U.S. becomes an international player, a world power, a superpower, is going to lend power and, and promote power into the hands of the president. Uh, the president is the face of the nation. You have, as I'm sitting here recording this, uh, you have television in, in earlier times, you have the internet, the radio, and so forth, so the president can use his uh, bully pulpit authority, Theodore Roosevelt's term, of the presidency and talk directly to the people. I think that's part of what uh, uh, in, enhances his power. So foreign policy, commander-in-chief, uh, head of the government, to be able to direct uh, resources around. And, and last but not least, you need to write this down too, the president is powerful because of his ability to appoint individuals. His appointment powers are exhaustive and extensive uh, and quite impressive. And so presidents, uh, regardless of party, have the ability to appoint office holders, and that influences uh, office holders in the form of judges, in the form of ambassadors, in the form of uh, clerks in the post office even. But that is an important aspect of the president's power.
uh, the most inconsequential office ever conceived of by the mind of man, according to John Adams, uh, a office that wasn't worth a bucket full of warm piss, according to John Nance Garner. Uh, John Adams once more said about this next office was is that he was nothing, but he might be everything. And that office is the office of the vice president. The vice presidency compared to the presidency, the presidency is where the action's at. The vice president, what does he do? He breaks ties in the Senate and he waits for a funeral. Whether it's the funeral of the one he's, if you're, if, if you're Machiavellian or just morbid, it's the one you're hoping for. But oftentimes you're a second-rate man and you are sent into uh, to funerals for second-rate countries. The pre if the Prime Minister of Great Britain dies and there's a big state funeral, the pres or the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Japan dies and there's a, a state funeral for the uh, Prime Minister, the President of the United States goes to that funeral. If it's the President of Chad or the President of Uruguay uh, it has died unexpectedly, then it's probably the Vice President who goes to that state funeral. And so the Vice Presidency has been occupied by cranks, kooks, and, and, and con men. Uh, it is a forgettable office. Uh, a few men who have uh, a few men who have held the office have been have been good men, but lots of them have frankly just been non-entities, zeros and quacks and cranks, as I've already said. All that to say is that the vice presidency is um, sometimes best described as a dumping ground, uh, or as as Adams, who was the first vice president, said, "I am nothing, but I might be everything." And so you're like the little kid at the candy store. Staring through the window, you can see the power of the presidency. You can see the prestige of the presidency. You can see all the the the, the glitter of the presidency, and the sweets and the uh, and all that goes with the presidency. And you might be there, but as that point at that point, you're just a little kid standing outside, locked out in the cold. So, last but not least, uh, in the uh, so, uh, the assembling of this U.S. government, in the assembling of the U.S. government in the 19th, excuse me, the 18th century under this Constitutional Convention is going to be the Supreme Court, which in the early days of the Republic was an, uh, an, almost an afterthought. Uh, the being Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court was nice, but it wasn't considered a capstone of a career. But of the three branches of government coming to the present time, of the three branches of the government, no branch of the government has grown more in stature and power than that of the judiciary. The Supreme Court today is so important that many people, uh, many of you who know people like this, I know them, overlooked many flaws of uh, Donald Trump as a candidate, and that whether it's Donald Trump as a candidate, Donald Trump as a person, and said, I am voting for Donald Trump because he is going to nominate judges that I want to nominate to the federal judiciary, whether that being the uh, uh, the, the district court or the circuit court or especially the Supreme Court. In fact, he, Trump, has nominated many, many judges to both the circuit court and to the district court. And even two judges to the Supreme Court. So, uh, a lot was overlooked uh, for that purpose because how many, it's true for Republicans and Democrats, lib uh, progressives and conservatives and libertarians and most Americans in any walk of life, they, uh, you can, a Congress can pass a law, the president can sign it, but until the Supreme Court signs off on it and says, yep, that is constitutional, until they do that, uh, you know, the law is kind of in limbo. And in effect, uh, you could say uh, a waggish individual years ago said it like this, and it's, I think it's true. It's, it was uh, sarcastic as he said it, but it was a true statement about the, the Constitution and the Supreme Court. And the question was, in a sense, rhetorical. What does the Constitution say? Correct answer should be whatever the Supreme Court says it says. And that's true to this day, I think. I, I think it's really true to this day, especially, is, is that we uh, each uh, year in a normal year uh, sit around somewhere starting in about May and June waiting for the Supreme Court to issue uh, directives and uh, issue uh, statements. People sit around like uh, they're waiting for uh, smoke signals being sent up from uh, a high and lofty mountain. I've never quite figured out what going to Ivy League law schools, uh, this is me giving some opinion now, I've never quite figured out what uh, going to an Ivy League law school uh, makes you more qualified to uh, you know, issue uh, rulings on this or that that have long-range impacts, but uh, what do I know? I'm a community college professor. All that to say, though, is, is that the Supreme Court is extraordinarily important. 
and uh, it's extraordinarily important today. You get appointed. It's a lifetime appointment. So if you appoint a person to the bench that's 45, 50 years old, assuming there's no car accidents or some, uh, un, you know, un, unexpected uh, medical issue, uh, they're going to, in all likelihood, live to be 75, 80, 85. So you could almost see 40 or 45 years of service on the court. And so when a, when a slot opens up on the Supreme Court of the United States, it becomes very uh, coveted by both political parties, by the factions in the country, especially since the Supreme Court is so important, uh, and it is there. Uh, by the way, the last important thing to say about the Supreme Court is its power. As I keep saying, what's the power that matters? It's uh, the ability to, uh, it's called judicial review. Uh, first done in Marbury versus Madison and actually won't be done again until uh, uh, Dred Scott. But every year, every term of the Supreme Court, uh, judges uh, on the district and circuit levels are going to issue stays and uh, strike down laws or actions or this or that uh, because it's unconstitutional. It flies in the face of the Constitution. So judicial review is the most important power in the toolbox of the judiciary. Well, the uh, Constitution is uh, written. Uh, it's written by a fellow named Governor Morris, who was, a, who was a real interesting scoundrel and a rake, but a pretty good writer as well. The flourish of we the people of the United States of America in order to form a more perfect union. That was Governor Morris, uh, the first lines of the preamble of the Constitution. <coughs> but it has to be adopted. And the short version, and I can let you, I might let you read that up a little bit in your, in your prep for your exam. But the short version of this is, is that the Constitution wasn't going to be adopted. Uh, it wasn't going to go into effect uh, unless you had, uh, was it nine of the 13 colonies or states now? The reality was is that you had to have certain states sign on. If Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania refused, those big three refused to sign the Constitution, it didn't matter. All the little states can line up and say, well, well we, we, we joined it. But it didn't matter. In Virginia, the arguments were fierce. Patrick Henry and George Mason, for example, were fiercely opposed to the Constitution, and, Ad uh, and uh, Madison is going to argue them down. It was a nip-and-tuck affair. Washington, uh, behind the scenes, uh, influenced people as best he could. New York, it was a close affair. Pennsylvania was a close affair. The Constitution, my point is this, is not a slam dunk. But... There were several things that were understood that if we vote for the Constitution today, we're going to get this tomorrow. It was kind of politic making, uh, one of which was uh, for Virginia, where are you going to put the capital? And eventually that's Washington, D.C., right next door to Virginia. Another question would be, who's going to be the first president? Well, most everybody understood that it would be Washington himself. George Washington would be the first president, and that was satisfying. But for a lot of the anti-federalists or those who might have interest in the anti-federalist thinking, <coughs> the anti-federalists were those who were opposed to the Constitution. The idea of a Bill of Rights, that was uh, thrown in for good measure. The Bill of Rights is going to be kind of the sop that uh, settles and qu calms the fears and, and settles the upset stomach or the nervous stomach of those who have issues with the Constitution. Uh, so th that Bill of Rights will come along rather quickly after you adopt the Constitution. All that to say, though, is, is that uh, in the, uh, uh, the arguments over the Constitution, if some of you are thinking about getting into law, you're going to have to read, uh, I would imagine, to some degree or another. I don't know all the ins and outs of law school, but I do know this, is that uh, the handbook of what does the Constitution mean and what, is it, what were they intending and what the founders were intending, the handbook, at least the most important one, is called the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were written by three men, John Jay, who wrote a half a dozen of them, uh, Tom, uh, James Madison, who wrote many of those uh, Federalist Papers, meaning essays that were published in New York newspapers and elsewhere, and then, of course, Alexander Hamilton, who wrote the most of them. All this to say is that the Constitution gets through. Uh, it's going to be adopted, and it, it is adopted, and is still the Constitution that we use today here in 2020. So we'll pick up with the Bill of Rights, and then we'll move on into the first presidents and, and so forth and talk about uh, foreign policy quite a bit going forward. Thank you very much.